I'd like to introduce our speaker, Faith Hardin. Faith is a master's student at Texas A&M University in the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Her research focuses on how species interact with each other, and we'll hear about some of that today. Before doing her master's, she has worked as a wildlife technician for multiple state and federal agencies, including in New Mexico, New York, and Maine. Through these experiences, she's worked with a wide variety of wildlife, including white-tailed deer, black bears, prairie dogs, butterflies, and of course, birds. Faith actually defended her master's in May, and she'll officially be graduating next month. She is going to be working for a consulting company and also applying for PhD positions. So Faith, congratulations, and thank you for joining us to share your work. Absolutely. So I have to say that this is probably the biggest group of people to ever get together to listen to a talk about golden in front of woodpeckers ever. So I'm really excited. So um, my thesis focused on specifically the golden fronted woodpecker and how it acts as an ecosystem engineer in southern Texas, where my field station was. But before we get into the specifics of what I did, I want to give a little bit of a crash course on what an ecosystem engineer is. And so there's two different types. There's an allogenic and an autogenic. And autogenic engineers alter an environment through their physical form. So like a coral reef or kelp beds, and they create nesting, foraging, and breeding resources for other organisms. The other type of ecosystem engineer is um, allogenic. And uh, this is what the woodpecker is. It's an allogenic ecosystem engineer that controls the availability of resources through modifications that they make to their environment, usually physical. And this modification increases species richness and abundance and can change the behavior of the animals that they recruit. One really great example of an allogenic engineer is the prairie dog. And this is what got me interested in wildlife science in the first place. Um, after graduating uh, from the University of New York, I, as an undergrad, I went to New Mexico to work at the Sevilla National Wildlife Refuge with Gunnison's prairie dogs. And prairie dogs act as ecosystem engineers by creating a burrow system underground that can aerate the soil and act as um, a nesting site for burrowing owls and hidey holes from lots of different uh, herps and insects and other small mammals. Here's just some more pictures of me, my young little innocent self out in the prairies of New Mexico, reintroducing some prairie dogs to their nat native uh, rangeland. And if you ever want to go to a beautiful uh, wildlife refuge, I definitely suggest hitting up Sevilla the National Wildlife Refuge. They have um, hundreds of acres of land and awesome bird watching. So coming back to my thesis as woodpeckers as ecosystem engineers, they do this in three different ways by excavating, live and dead trees during uh, nesting and foraging. And when they forage, they create thousands of tiny holes in the wood as they search for insects. And this uh, increases the heterogeneity of the environment, which can be beneficial to insects that colonize in lots of these small holes created in the trees. They also create roosting cavities, which are actually different than their nesting cavities. They use the roosting cavities during the non-breeding season and they can have multiple entrances and it keeps them um, out of the heat of the day and safe from predators at night. And then of course they also make nesting cavities, uh, sometimes multiple a year to raise their young. And a fun fact, maybe many of you already know this, but woodpeckers don't create a you know, physical uh, like twiggy nest inside of their cavities. They'll often just leave a couple small wood chips at the bottom of the cavity and lay their eggs right on the bottom. So even though it's costly to create a new cavity for every brood or for every year, most species of woodpeckers excavate new cavities um, 
to avoid predation and parasite infestation. So in this really great paper in 1991, they found that black woodpecker fledgling rates were 33% higher in new cavities that the birds created rather than reused ones. And that's mainly because of that guy in the bottom right there, the pine martin. They found that the pine martins would remember where they found a profitable nest one year or one, one predation time, and they'd return to that nest up to 10 days searching for um, new eggs or nests, new eggs or chicks to take advantage of. So this drive to create new cavities every year results in an abundance of cavities left behind in the woodpecker home ranges, which are really beneficial for secondary cavity nesting organisms, or as I'll abbreviate throughout the talk, SCN. So secondary cavity nesters come in lots of shapes and sizes. They can be other birds, like this eastern screech owl or the Buick wren. They can also be other invertebrates, uh, reptiles, amphibians, and of course the flying squirrel is a famous secondary cavity nesting mammal. But interestingly enough, um, these secondary cavity nesters have two different options when it comes to picking a cavity. It can choose to put it in a woodpecker cavity, which can be hard to find and are in high demand, or they can choose a natural cavity, which um, are often irregularly shaped and tend to be extremely decayed and do not have regular dimensions on the inside like a woodpecker cavity. And this uh, really irregular shape and high decay can cause nest mortality because predators are usually more ease, uh, able to uh, dig away at highly decayed wood than they are at um, the trees that woodpeckers normally decide to put their, their nests in. And a really great well-studied system of a woodpecker acting as an ecosystem engineer is the red cockaded woodpecker in the south, um, specifically in the southern pine systems of Louisiana. They um, kind of have this symbiotic relationship with the red-hearted fungus. So the red-hearted fungus will get on their feathers and then as the woodpecker flies from tree to tree, they spread the fungus to the trees and it softens the wood enough for the woodpeckers to excavate the tree. And that's important because the red cockaded woodpecker is the only bird species in that area that's a strong enough excavator to create cavities in those trees, which are then heavily, heavily depended on by other secondary cavity nesting birds like the tufted titmouse and the brown headed nuthatch. But cavity usefulness declines within six years, and more, sec uh, more cavities need to be created annually to support populations of secondary cavity nesting birds. So there was a nice bulk of literature on woodpeckers acting as ecosystem engineers. There's this species, but there's many others that I was able to use as I prepared my own study. So as I mentioned a little bit at the beginning, woodpeckers uh, are ecosystem engineers not only through the abandoned cavities that they leave behind, but also through the foraging holes that they leave behind when they're searching for invertebrate prey. And these holes increase habitat heterogeneity, which uh, there's been a whole bunch of literature on this before that's shown that increased habitat heterogeneity increases insect abundance. Think of a tree with only a couple branches without leaves on them compared to a tree with many branches and many leaves. There's obviously more room and places for insects to set up shop in a fully, function, fully flushed out tree than a thin one. And while many invertebrates are eaten by birds, the principal component are always insects. In woodpeckers, this is no different, but they do tend to focus on beetles and hymenoptera, which is the order of ants, flies, and wasps, mainly because these are the types of insects that are easily gotten by the woodpecker in dense wood that other birds are unable to access. 
And it's important to know that even bird species that are granivorous for the majority of the year tend to increase the amount of insects in their diet during the breeding season due to increased protein demands for creating eggs and feeding young developing chicks. So if there's a tie between uh, woodpeckers increasing ha habitat heterogeneity, which then causes an increase in insect abundance in an area, which then is beneficial to the local avian community as a whole. That was kind of the thought process I had when I was creating this project. So yeah, the majority of the inferences made about woodpeckers as ecosystem engineers has been focused on how they impact primarily secondary cavity nesting organisms and mainly secondary cavity nesting birds. But there might be a bigger picture here that was never really explored before, and that is that these birds might be influencing the greater avian assemblage as a whole beyond the dependent secondary cavity nesters. So to investigate this, I did all of my field work on the San Antonio Viejo Ranch, part of the East Foundation properties in South Texas. And there on the right, you can see the Golden Fronted Woodpeckers Range. It goes up through Texas and a little bit into Oklahoma, but it's a mainly South Texas and Central American bird. There was my study site. Pretty much just pretty far south in the continental United States that you can get. So using the golden front of woodpecker, I wanted to investigate how woodpeckers might influence secondary cavity nesters in South Texas, but also how woodpeckers, the insect assemblage, and the greater avian community interacted together as a kind of trophic flow. So the first objective was to determine if there were any correlations between the insect assemblage and the golden fronted woodpecker's nest site selection and also if insects were correlated with the home range sizes of the woodpecker. So the biggest challenge that any ecologist has, and especially an avian ecologist, is finding the birds' nests. And this is a massive ranch, over 200,000 acres in Southern Texas, which has a lot of really harsh plants, cactus, thorn scrub. Um, so I didn't want to have to comb the whole ranch to find my birds. Instead, I created a grid across the ranch and then used woodpecker counts from the past four years that the ranch had um, and extracted observations of the golden fronted woodpeckers to the center of each grid and then interpolated those values across the ranch, just estimating uh, the empty spaces where we didn't have information based on the information that we did have. And what you might notice is that in the northern pastures, there was a pretty strong sample bias. And this is actually um, the result of a long-term monitoring project that the San Antonio VA Hill Ranch is doing um, to see how cattle impact the bird populations. So there were just more survey points in the northern pastures that created that issue, not that there were just more birds. So to address this, I zoomed in and did the grid again on a finer scale and followed the same process to find areas that were most likely to contain woodpeckers based on previous years. And here, uh, the purple spots indicate areas of high probability of finding woodpeckers. So within those areas of high probability, I placed 12 one kilometer survey plots within the four different bio biome types present on the ranch, which is early cereal, which is the kind of landscape that you get um, with young successional forests, maybe after a burn or after a clearing, uh, grasslands, shrublands, and woodlands. So me and my technicians visited the plots four times in early spring to record and detect woodpecker activity with the intent of locating their nests. So we watched we walked uh, three transects through each plot, and anytime we encountered a woodpecker, I followed it for up to 30 minutes, taking a GPS point every minute. And I feel like it's important to note that on this ranch, the golden fronted woodpecker is the only species of woodpecker that's a strong enough 
um, excavated to create cavities in the dense mesquite wood. That's 90% uh, of the trees on the ranch are mesquite. And one of the challenging things about woodpecker work is that it can be difficult to access cavities, especially in um, the more northern areas of the United States where a lot of woodpecker research has happened. You hear stories of people climbing 50 feet in a tree with ladders and climbing equipment just to look into a cavity that they find to be empty. But the nice thing about working in South Texas that kind of over, um, overrides the, the heat and the prickly pear cactus is that the trees were fairly stunted. So I could check most cavities by standing on the ground or making a short trip into the tree. And I actually used a small um, periscoping camera that I got off of Amazon for 30 bucks that I could use to take video and pictures of the inside of the cavity and it sent the videos and pictures straight to my phone. So I had a live action shot of what was going on in the cavity. And so here's some pictures. There's a ash-floated flycatcher chicks in the top right, the day that they hatched. There's an eastern screech owl in the bottom left and the top right. And uh, there's some beautiful little golden-fronted woodpecker chicks about a week old in the bottom right. And just to give you guys an idea of the kind of video I had, here is a male golden-fronted woodpecker who is guarding the eggs while a female is out foraging. He is definitely a little bit surprised that a long black shiny snake has snuck into his cavity in the middle of the day. And you can kind of see the eggs there behind him. There are about five in that cavity. So once I found all the nests in these survey plots, I then chose sites 300 meters away from the nest that had similar vegetation types, but no woodpecker activity. And I, clarif I should clarify that we studied these sites extensively. So we knew that if there was woodpecker activity in these woodpecker absence sites or not, because we spent many days and many weeks walking through them seeing if we found evidence of foraging or excavation. So these sites uh, acted as woodpecker absent points to compare insect and avian differences between sites and they had uh, a similar vegetation alliance, which means that the uh, predominant and secondary uh, vegetation types were the same between the active and the unoccupied sites. So for the first part of objective one, I needed to quantify, calculate insect availability around sites occupied by a woodpecker and those that were unoccupied. So I chose a subset of 24 golden-fronted woodpecker nests that I had found. I ended up finding around 55, but that was too many to do all these insect surveys on. And I collected insects on using a sweep net in an array outwards from the center of the nest to 150 meters. I sorted, dried, and weighed the insect orders per point per site. And because insect abundance can fluctuate wildly during different seasons and, and times of the summer, dependent on uh, rainfall, I sampled each site uh, seven times from May to July. And for the second part of objective one, I needed to relate the insect loads to the home ranges of the woodpecker. So on the same subset of nests that I had collected insect data on, I calculated the home range size of each pair by following the male of each pair four times for 30 minutes each, taking a GPS point every minute for a total of 120 observation points per male. It got challenging because as anyone who's followed birds and tried to determine home range sizes can tell you, it was pretty difficult to keep your eyes on the bird. So if I ever lost sight of the bird, I would come back at a later time and follow him again as he exited the nest to ensure that it was the same male. So then by putting all of those points per male together, I could visualize their home ranges and then test for correlations between the biomass of each insect order that I had collected on their uh, home range sites. So just to recap a little bit of 
what my field work uh, resulted in. Overall, I found 55 active nests, and of those nests, nine were in early cereal, 12 were in grassland, 12 were in shrubland, and 22 were in woodland, which makes biological sense if you think about it, because woodlands tend to have the most suitable trees for excavation, versus early cereal tend to not have as many large uh, trees with DVH or diameter rest height, so essentially width that's big enough for the woodpeckers to put a cavity into. So using all the insect data that I collected, I found that woodpecker nesting sites were positively correlated with the presence of Coleoptera, beetles, Orthoptera, grasshoppers and locusts, and Hymenoptera, ants, bees, and wasps. And then I found that the home range sizes were negatively correlated with beetles, grasshoppers, and flies. And you might think negative, that's a bad thing, but actually it means it was pointing to the fact that the more food that is abundant on a site, the less the animal has to travel to find adequate food to feed itself and its chicks. So high numbers of its food on its territory, on its home range sizes, allow them to have smaller home ranges that they had to defend. So less energy needed to be expended. And interestingly enough, I found that the uh, phasmatodia or stick insects were positively correlated. So that meant that it had the opposite relationship. And I'm not sure why I couldn't find anything. Um, it might just be something to do with the vegetation types that the beetles and the grasshoppers like, but the uh, stick insects aren't so fond of, so you don't find as many of them there. So while it wasn't surprising that the beetles and flies were related to the site selection and home range size of the woodpecker, I was surprised at the strong correlations I saw with the grasshoppers, mainly because they're not commonly eaten by woodpeckers. So we can infer that some orders of insects might be um, correlated with the site and behavior in terms of home range sizes of this golden front woodpecker. I also wanted to know if there are any correlations between the woodpecker's presence and the avian community as a whole. So to do this, I did three rounds of point counts or bird surveys and all on all of the occupied and unoccupied sites during the breeding season. And then using, the, and using this point count data, I calculated avian species richness, which is the number of species and the abundance, which is just the abundant, the number of, uh, you know, number of birds, and compared sites occupied by a woodpecker to those sites without. The literature has also shown a strong trend in avian species richness and abundance in terms of biome or vegetation types. So to address this issue, I compared the occupied and unoccupied sites between the four different biomes that the surveying plots were placed on. And then using some simple t-tests to compare the means of species richness and abundance, I found that on sites occupied by the golden-fronted woodpecker, species richness was higher. Overall, the avian community was, had a higher species richness. Also that the overall abundance of birds was higher on occupied sites. And then I split that into uh, the abundance of non-cavity nesting species, and that was also higher, as well as those birds that are dependent on cavities, other secondary cavity nesters. That one wasn't surprising, but the other ones were interesting. So when biome was taken into consideration, there was no, and I know this might sound a little, look a little overwhelming, but I'm going to break it down for you. So when biome was taken into consideration, there was no significant difference in either species richness nor the abundance of non-cavity nesting birds. However, when I separated out the secondary cavity nesting birds and again compared site types, uh, there were more secondary cavity nesting birds than expected in the grassland and early cereal biomes. So, what might that be telling us? Both early cereal and grasslands have comparatively low number of trees suitable for cavity excavation. 
part of their nature. Making abandoned woodpecker cavities in these biomes that much more important. In fact, previous studies have shown that the reliance of secondary cavity nesting birds on woodpeckers can be dependent on the environment. So for example, Weave in 2011 found that the introduction of a woodpecker to a heavily forested site didn't have a big impact on secondary cavity nesting bird populations. But when he removed woodpeckers, uh, when a similar study looked at the removal of woodpeckers from a early cereal uh, environment in 2010, secondary cavity nesters were severely impacted. There's less trees, you have less options, and in areas that have very low opportunities for uh, cavities, having a woodpecker around is pretty good. So moving on to the third objective. So now I wanted to understand what might be determining the success of the woodpecker nests themselves. So I monitored all of the 55 active woodpecker nests throughout the breeding season and recorded whether the nest succeeded, which meant that at least one chick fledged or failed. And then I, uh, after, it, after it fledged, I took the following measurements of the cavity that was left behind. And all of these uh, variables have been determined to be um, in, important in the success of primary cavity nesting birds, so woodpeckers, in previous literature. So first, the height of the cavity from the ground. Uh, the higher a tree is, the less likely it is to be predated on by climbing tree snakes or mammals like rats and squirrels. Uh, the diameter of the tree at breast height, or abbreviated to DBH. The thicker the tree is, the more insulated the eggs and chicks are. And in hot temperatures, especially like in South Texas, the thick walls of a tree um, are better able to thermoregulate than thin trees. The depth of, I measure the depth of the cavity. Uh, this one's pretty simple. The deeper the cavity, the more protection um, they have from mustelids and snakes. There's a mustelid. And I also measured uh, the vegetation cover of the cavity. So it, this is interesting. Uh, most non-cavity nesting birds, so cup nesters, ground nesters, prefer denser cover on their nests. But literature shows that cavity nesting birds have a strong preference for low cover. So that means that they don't like their cavities to be obscured. And this is probably because their nests are already pretty well hidden and it's difficult for them to look out of the nest at their surroundings. So if they want to see a predator approaching their cavity, they want to have a clear line of sight versus a cup nester is going to depend on vegetation covering its nest for protection. I also measured the diameter of the entrance hole. Uh, this one again is pretty simple. The wider the cavity entrance is, um, the more likely a predator will be able to fit in to grab eggs or chicks. I also measured the nesting decay state of the tree, um, and this was a more contentious one in the literature. The majority of past studies show that woodpeckers prefer to nest in snags or highly decayed trees or dying trees or parts of trees that are dying. However, the decay of a tree can also influence the internal temperature of a nest. Live wood is a better thermal regulator because it has a higher concentration of water that protects eggs and chicks from high temperatures. The trade-off is that woodpeckers who choose a live tree to put their nest in need to spend considerably more time excavating um, the hard, dense live wood than the soft wood of a highly decayed tree. So there's kind of this balancing act. And I, to determine the decay rank of a tree, I use the USFS, United States Forest Service, snag guide to rank trees from one being a live tree to seven being a dead tree with no bark, no branches, no leaves. And then this one was easy. Uh, 
in the literature, the species of tree is usually very important. Different species can have different hardnesses, different uh, average uh, diameters. But on my site, all of the trees that were chosen as a nesting spot for the golden fronted woodpecker were honey mesquite. So that was easy, easy variable. So then I modeled the success or failure of a woodpecker nest using those variables. And that just meant combining different variables to see which combination of variables most likely predicted the success or failure of a woodpecker nest. Um, and through this, I found that the decay of a tree and the nest cover of a tree were the most significant predictors of at least one chick fledging. And then, when we actually look at the details of that model, we see the odds ratio is 1.1 times higher in a nest with higher coverage and 0.4 times lower in a tree with high levels of decay. So what does that mean? Um, that just means that, um, that just means that the woodpeckers tended to do better in highly covered cavities in live trees and did poorly in exposed cavities in dead, decayed trees. So these results highlight again the potential importance of temperature regulation for these scrubland desert birds. So we might have the beginnings of a trend happening here that's not previously been recorded, uh, with arid woodpeckers choosing to nest in trees of higher density for the trade-off of thermal regulation benefits. And perhaps through comparative study, a thermal regulation gradient from northern woodpeckers in dead trees to desert woodpeckers in more live trees. So now we move on to the last objective. How may, how may woodpeckers be influencing secondary cavity nesting birds that live around them? So around each of the active woodpecker nests that I found, and around each of the 55 unoccupied sites that I chose, I searched for secondary cavity nesting birds within 150 meters of the center. Each site was visited by me or my technicians every three to five days, and all secondary cavity nesters were monitored throughout the breeding season. And for these guys, I recorded the same set of predictor variables as before, but with one added predictor, whether or not the nest was in an abandoned woodpecker cavity or a naturally occurring one. So as I touched at, at the beginning, abandoned woodpecker nests are more regularly shaped. They've literally been designed by a bird for nesting. Um, so they tend to be in more stable trees than naturally occurring holes. However, woodpecker cavities may not be available or be in short supply. So what exactly are the benefits of using a secondhand home? So using the same model building process as for before, I tested and created four different models for the four most common secondary cavity nesting birds on the ranch. The Buick's Wren, the Black Crested Titmouse, and the two cavity nesting flycatchers, the ash-throated and the brown-crested. Since the two flycatchers are almost impossible to tell apart by sight and have very similar uh, life history traits, I decided to combine all of those observations for one model. And while I did find some eastern screech owl nests um, in secondary, in abandoned woodpecker holes, I didn't have enough data points. I only found 12 nests. So I couldn't build a model out of only 12 nests. But it should be interesting that every single eastern screech owl nest that I found was in an abandoned woodpecker hole. I didn't find any in naturally occurring cavities. So again, I'm going to break this down. Um, for the Buick Wren, I found that nest success was predicted by the amount of vegetation covering the nest and whether or not it was in an abandoned woodpecker cavity and the DBH of the tree. So origin here means uh, the origin of the cavity. So woodpecker or not. And then for the flycatchers, I found that the important predictors of a nest succeeding were the decay rate of the nesting tree, the diameter of the nesting hole, 
and whether or not it was in an abandoned woodpecker cavity. And then finally for the titmouse, I found that uh, nesting success was again determined by the decay of the tree and whether or not it was in an abandoned woodpecker nest. Hopefully you are starting to see a trend here. So the most interesting thing that I found, I think, is that every species of secondary cavity nester had higher nest success in abandoned woodpecker nests uh, than in naturally occurring ones. In fact, if we look at the details of these models, Buick Wren's odds of succeeding were 7.5 times higher in a woodpecker cavity. And the odds of a, uh, so you can look over here for the odds ratio, that's it right there. Um, oh, you can't see my screen. But it looks like the O got chopped off, so it's just DDS ratio in between lower and higher. And uh, the odds of a flycatcher uh, having a successful nest were 35 times higher in a woodpecker cavity. And then again, the titmouse was 15 times higher. So these odds ratios for the flycatcher and the titmouse were very high, indicating that they probably relied heavily on abandoned woodpecker nests. The view of the was a little bit lower, but it was still significant. Next little hurts. So if we look at a different part of this, uh, the flycatcher and the titmouse were also negatively affected by highly decayed trees. The Buick Wren was not. And this actually helps my argument because Buick Wrens are fairly hardy and flexible with their nests, while flycatchers and titmice are more sensitive to changes in the environment, which might require them to build in a more stable atmosphere, like a woodpecker cavity. And in fact, Buick wrens will essentially build their nest in anything resembling a cavity. People find them in fence posts, completely metal, uh, drain pipes, and old logs. So we see a strong trend of secondary cavity nesters having higher success when associated with a woodpecker cavity. And in fact, when I looked at the metrics uh, or the measurements of all available cavities that I found throughout my sites, whether abandoned woodpecker or naturally occurring, and whether they were used or not, I found some really strong trends. Woodpecker cavities were all higher from the ground in less decayed trees, had a lower DBH, so they um, had a larger DBH, so they were wider, had more nest coverage by vegetation, had smaller entrance holes and deeper cavity depths. All traits that protect eggs and chicks from both uh, temperature fluxes from the hot days in southern Texas that can reach 115 degrees and from predation. So just to kind of tie everything together, I found that woodpecker nest site and territory size correlated strongly with more than just beetles, woodpecker's favorite food, but also with bees, ants, and wasps, the hymenoptera, and also grasshoppers and locusts as well. And the strong correlation with grasshoppers was surprising. Uh, the literature hasn't previously indicated that. There's a high proportion of their diets. It's mainly just been um, opportunistic grabbing of them that has been recorded. Um, and that's mainly because woodpeckers aren't designed to grab grasshoppers off the ground or out of the air. One interesting thing about the life history of the golden fronted woodpecker is that even though it's a strong excavator and can eat hard to reach grubs out of trees, it also forages on the ground similar to how poor excavators like the northern flicker do. Additionally, when I was in the field, I often saw the woodpecker, uh, one of the woodpeckers I was uh, following, watching, fly out over the grass and grab a grasshop uh, grasshopper on the wing and bring it back to its nesting tree and cache it on the mesquite thorn, which I thought was really interesting because as far as I know, there hasn't been any observations of uh, the golden-fronted woodpecker caching its insect prey. So similar to a shrike, how shrikes can impale their prey on barbed wire or thorns to save it for later. So clearly this woodpecker has a diverse diet. And this diet generalist might come into an area with ample food, 
create cavities that build up over time and encourage secondary cavity nesters to come in. Where those secondary cavity nesters not only benefit from the uh, stable cavities that are left behind, but also from the opportunistically high insect loads that encourage the woodpeckers to come there in the first place. Addition additionally, there seems to be some kind of correlation between the woodpecker presence and the species richness and abundance of the avian community as a whole, but that might merely be due to the abundance of insects in an area, um, which could be determined by vegetation. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to completely tease that out, but I do think it would be a really interesting avenue for future study. But ultimately, the thing that I want you to take away from this is the importance of abandoned woodpecker cavities to these secondary cavity nesting birds. So here we have a little blue wren nests. Um, and that the beneficial placement and construction of these cavities make them excellent secondhand homes for local secondary cavity nesting birds. So something that you get asked a lot as a graduate student is, what would you do if you had a million dollars? if you got a million dollar grant. Um, and I think one of the more interesting things to come out of this project is this dependence, uh, apparent dependence on temperature and how it changes the bird's behavior. So if I had a million dollars, I would like to do an extensive study of woodpeckers from the entire uh, continental United States or even North America to see if um, there's any trends in the nest placement of woodpeckers based on temperature. So if there's a strong correlation between temperature and whether they put them in live trees or dead trees, with the thought being that as you go further south, the woodpeckers begin to uh, kind of play the game of the trade-off between putting more energy into making uh, a cavity in a live tree because of the benefits it gives of protecting their eggs and chicks. So with that, oh, and this is just a little example of, these are where most of the woodpecker studies have been done before. It's not comprehensive, obviously, but you can see that most of them are in higher latitudes, whereas my study was very far south in kind of a unique ecosystem, the Tom and Lincoln thorn scrub. But I would like to mention that even though most of Texas is privately owned, um, organizations like the East Foundation um, that really value conservation can be amazing opportunities for research and access to these unique ecosystems. Something that a lot of my fellow graduate students have trouble with here at Texas A&M is getting access to um, private land because 98% of Texas is privately owned. Um, but organizations like the East Foundation can make that much easier. Um, and just a shout out to some of the people that helped me along my way. Andrea was the uh, one of the ranch managers who helped me get my XUV, XUVs out of ditches when I got stuck or I popped tires. And then to the many other graduate students that were alongside me the whole time, um, uh, my committee who gave me lots of help with um, developing my statistics and study design and the many friends that I made along the way. So with that, I will open it up to any questions. Um, our first question is from Samantha. She asks, is an ecosystem engineer the same as a keystone species? Mm. So those are tricky terms and I know a lot of people in my department don't like the phrase uh, keystone species because it's kind of like a catch-all for anything that could be important in an ecosystem. Um, I would say with no certain, with no certainty, because it's kind of an ambiguous term, that an ecosystem engineer would fall under the umbrella of a keystone species. But uh, and a keystone species can include other organisms that are important for other things, even though they don't physically change the environment. Got it. I'm not sure if that was helpful. Yeah, it's great to distinguish those terms. Oh. Um, Jared says that red cockaded woodpeckers are one of the coolest endangered species. 
Are they the only woodpecker in North America to make a cavity in a live tree? So um, they're not, it's just that they are kind of restricted in the trees that they live around. So they're kind of limited to only live trees in that ecosystem. But um, my studies show that um, the golden fronted woodpecker, which is North America, does sometimes excavate in live trees. So there's another example right there. Ronnie asked, what accounts for the spread in Orthoptera numbers? It seemed like there were plenty that were close to and far away in the home range, but none in the middle. Is this a factor of vegetation? So Orthopterans are spread close and far away. Um, I'm not sure they were, I think, I think what you're asking is that there were a lot of them close to the nest. So what I found was that there were a lot of, a lot of orthopterans, so uh, grasshoppers, locusts, near the nest sites of the woodpeckers. And I don't think that that was particularly something that the woodpecker was causing and more of the woodpecker was choosing areas that had high numbers of orthopterans to put its nest by. So then as you go away from the nest, they're just, you know, randomly tend to be less orthopterans because they're, uh, oh, okay, so they would definitely be dependent on vegetation. So the woodpeckers were choosing these sites because of the food abundance, and the food abundance is definitely dependent on water availability and the vegetation type. Um, Eway asked, does hosting woodpeckers over time impact the survival of the tree? Mm, it can, um, depending on the size of the tree. So I, I, I found what I call the mother tree. It was absolutely massive. It was maybe like five people couldn't put their arms around it. Um, and it had, I think, over 40 different cavities in it. But because of the size of the tree, it seemed like it was doing okay. But there were some smaller trees that like I could put my arms around just me that clearly looked like they were having a rough time. Because lots of fungus can get in, fungus, bacteria, insects can get into the heartwood of the tree if it's too small and destroy it from the inside out. Leticia asked, um, why do secondary cavity nesters have higher success in reusing a woodpecker nest when woodpeckers have lower success reusing the cavity? Do pine martens not have the same predation impact on secondary cavity nesters? Mm, I see. So, so fortunately there weren't any pine martens in my study system. Um, they're mainly a northern species. But so woodpeckers tend to have pretty high nest success rates compared to other birds um, because they're like the first one to come in there and they establish that cavity. If they reuse the cavity, their success rate tends to go down to the same level that the secondary cavity nesters do. Um, the success rate for my woodpeckers that created their own cavity was about 70%, which is pretty high for a nesting bird. Um, but the secondary cavity nesters had success rates of more like 40 percent. Interesting. Um, Ronnie asked, how often do woodpeckers get mole crickets? Are they finding them in rotted wood near the base of old trees? This species is often in the soil and not higher up in trees. So I did see the golden fronted woodpecker foraging on the ground. It was pretty interesting. Um, I know that I've seen pileated woodpeckers do that before. I know I've seen northern flickers do that before, but it is kind of strange for strong excavating species to do this. Um, and I also saw them grab them off the, off the wing. So I think that they're just really generalist when it comes to their diet. And if they see something, they're going to go get it. And I think that is the result of living in a desert ecosystem, which is not as picky because there's just not as much food 
see. Um, Tiffany asked, do woodpeckers affect insect abundance in ecosystems like the one presented here? That's the million dollar question. That's actually what I set out to answer when I first started two years ago, but I didn't, because I didn't know what I was doing, to be perfectly honest. I was a young scientist. Uh, I didn't set up my study right to look at that. Um, I essentially looked at uh, like correlations between them, not causation, and, and then built off of that. So to look at if woodpeckers are causing increases in insects, I'd have to have like control sites where I knew there was no woodpecker and then the woodpecker came in and like several years of both to see an increase or change between those. So I just didn't have enough time to answer that question, but I think it would be, a, honestly, it wouldn't even be that difficult as long as you could like figure out where the woodpecker was going to nest, which might be the difficult part of that. Because you have to have the pre-control. Maybe that's a potential PhD project for someone. Yeah. <laughs> um, Judy asked, how long do woodpeckers generally stay in a particular cavity? Um, and is this year round or only during the breeding season? So they, um, they only use the nesting cavity while the eggs and chicks are hatching or are, are there. They don't come back to that cavity after the chicks have left. So they have a pretty long development period as chicks. It can take, so just a, like a scope of the, the length of time it takes for them to do this whole process. It can take two to three weeks to excavate the cavity. Um, once that, and after they're done, they immediately lay the eggs, usually one day at a time. And then it can take uh, two to three weeks for those eggs to hatch, and then four weeks for the chicks to develop enough to fledge. So it's a pretty long period of time, um, like two months almost, which does limit the number of broods that they can have a season. Um, but once they're done raising the brood in that cavity, they'll either risk it by uh, laying another brood immediately or go off and make a new one. And outside of the breeding season, they'll occasionally use roosting cavities, which um, kind of have multiple entrances, but often they'll just sleep on like the side of a tree at night. Let's see, uh, Laura asked, what about woodpeckers, okay, what is it about woodpeckers that nest in live trees that makes them better excavators than ones that nest in dead trees? Mm. So it's more of the fact of how difficult it is to excavate those two things. So if you were a bird that you observe them primarily excavating dead and decayed wood, you can assume that they're poor excavators because they're not choosing harder wood. They're limited to really soft wood, which even in northern ecosystems, really soft wood, um, aside from temperature effects, because it's not really an issue in northern altitude or northern uh, latitudes, it's, it's a problem because predators can just rip it apart. Like really soggy, decayed wood, like even I can rip it apart. Um, but if you see birds that are excavating in healthier wood, you, they're, they're able to expand beyond that because of superior excavating skills. Okay. Um, this is a classic woodpecker question. Fred asked, how do they avoid concussions or brain damage? <laughs> so um, it's, it's pretty interesting. The same, so I am not a neurobiologist by any means, but I did have enough people ask me this that I dug a little bit myself. And it seems like the chemical in our brains that build up when we get concussions, like a boxer, um, is damaging to our brain tissue, but it actually strengthens woodpecker brain tissue. So the same thing that hurts us strengthens them. And if you want like more weird morphology, physiology facts about woodpeckers, um, there a lot of woodpecker species tongues actually split around their throat and wrap around their skull, and some species even continue to wrap around their eye sockets. And it's just like an artifact of evolution because they need that long tongue to extend down into a tree, but just like any muscle, it needs to contract and spread. Well, you can only contract so much, 
So it had to get longer and longer and it split and went around the neck and then up and around the head because that's the only place it could go. It's such a great woodpecker effect. Um, yeah. So <laughs> um, Katrina asked, do their beaks keep growing like a beaver or does it wear down? Huh. I, I don't know. I assume they keep growing. That's a great question that I just do not know the answer to. I don't, I don't think that, hmm. I don't think it, it, if it does grow back, it's definitely not as rapid as like a beaver tooth or a fingernail. Um, but just thinking about it, surely it wears down their beak. I think, I think if it does wear down their beak and they don't regrow, they just don't have very long lifespans. So it's kind of a problem of like, well, maybe it would be an issue later in life, but they usually just don't make it that long. Uh, Ronnie asked, are coleopterans a better food for woodpeckers since they are a favorite food? Do they contain more fat and protein than other insects? So I don't think that it's that. Uh, coleopterans, so beetles, tend to have uh, really thick armor, so they're really chitinous, uh, which can make them not the best food. Um, however, they're preferred by woodpeckers because of their exclusive, exclusive exclusivity. Um, woodpeckers are often the only bird species that can access them in the wood. So just because uh, it's a kind of an untapped resource that there's usually a lot of compared to the other insect orders which they'd be competing with other bird species for. Oh that's interesting. Jan asked, do you know what Bay Area woodpecker species is closest to golden fronted? So here we have things like the pileated woodpecker, downy, um, we have, I think we have hairy, uh, flickers, um, what else, nut owls, woodpecker, I think those are the main ones. Probably the flicker, probably the flicker. Um, oh, acorn woodpecker. Yeah, the, I'm pretty sure, so like the hairy and downy are a different family. Um, I'm pretty sure the pileated is as well. I would say probably the flicker, which I think is an interesting thing because the flicker isn't known to be a strong excavator hmm. right, versus the golden front of the woodpecker, which is. Okay. Um, also, I, I realized I missed a question earlier from Laura. I apologize for that. How closely related are sap suckers to woodpeckers? Are sap suckers considered ecosystem engineers? And if so, are they as beneficial as woodpeckers? So I don't, I don't know about the relatedness. Um, I probably should. That would have been a great defense question. But um, I can speak to their role as ecosystem engineers. Um, I don't think that there's been as much research on them as ecosystem engineers because it's not as flashy. Like we don't have other vertebrates using the resources that they leave behind. But for anybody who might not be familiar with it, uh, sap suckers make rows of, of holes around trees and it oozes the sap out. And then insects become attracted to the sap and the sap sucker will come back and eat the insects. So clearly, I think there's a lot of opportunity for them to be ecosystem engineers for those insects that are taking advantage of it. And then I don't think, as far as I know, there haven't been any studies on other birds taking advantage of the insects that are being attracted to those to that sap, but that would be a way that they'd act. So it would be ecosystem engineering in two different ways. Oh, sounds like there's a lot of um, potential topics that someone could study. Um, yep. Yeah, and uh, let's see. Jan had a follow-up question because um, he had asked about the flicker or the relatedness. Um, to Bay Area birds, and he asked if you think your work might apply to flickers. To flickers? I think, yeah, I think the flicker, you said flicker, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the flicker is a pretty well spread out bird, like geographically. I know that we have them in the Northeast, clearly you have them in the West. So you in terms of looking at how temperature might impact their the trade-off between excavation and energy expenditure, 
I think that could be a really cool species to do a similar study with. See if flickers in different habitats in different environments make different nest site selections. Um, but in terms of them support, supporting other bird species, I don't think that their cavities are as in high of demand because flickers tend to excavate uh, pretty dead wood. And um, if, a tree is, if a tree is decayed enough for a flicker to excavate, once the flicker is done with it, it's going to continue to decay and eventually it won't be suitable anymore. Yeah, and uh, I guess related to those previous questions, Chris mentioned that it seems to be that acorn wo woodpeckers are probably the closest that we have here to mm. um, golden fronted, but I imagine it, it's probably similar in terms of um, the answer you gave. No, that's good to know. I, I am really bad at phylogeny. Uh, <laughs> it's something that I need to get stronger in, but that's interesting to know. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thank you again, Faith, for sharing your cool research with us. It's always nice to hear about, you know, cutting edge, re edge research that's being done. So, uh, Faith, is there anything else you want to add? Um, in terms of this, no. Um, I'm just really happy that you guys showed up. I'm really flattered that I think it was like 138 people came to listen to me talk about woodpeckers. It's really nice. Um, this felt in ways like a little mini defense, and but with much kinder questions, I should add. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard being a graduate student right now because you're like separated from your community, but having people like you guys come and support my research is nice, and important.